Good morning. Let's do it again. Good morning. Hey, would you please thank our worship team this morning? Come on. Oh, come on. That's a little weak. Come on. Yeah. You know, not just the worship team, but worship team and several other people, media, tech, uh, several volunteers, they show up before 7 a.m. every Sunday. They're here serving. Um, and so, yeah. So, uh, because I get to be part of the worship team, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If today you go to lunch and you run into them at a restaurant, wherever you go, buy them lunch. Okay? All right? Three people. That's cool. Hey, that's fine. All right. Hey, let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for uh, your presence that is, is, is with us. And uh, your presence uh, manifests itself in a powerful way when we gather, when we worship, when we sing, when we pray, when we declare your name. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today. Uh, Lord, I pray that anything that would hinder um, your voice uh, in our lives would be, would be uh, set aside and moved aside. Lord, I pray that you would teach us, that you would convict us, that you would correct us, that you would guide us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, so I get to share the word today, and uh, we're in this series called Stories Jesus Told. And Jesus used to tell stories to teach truth. The Bible calls them parables. So a parable is when Jesus tells a story and throws the truth alongside it so we can learn more about him, about his kingdom. And today we're going to look at a story Jesus told that is powerful, it's wise, it's insightful. And if we can apply and learn from it, uh, it has the power to transform our lives, has the power to change our lives. And uh, before I get into the story, the story has a lot to do with some pictures I brought. How many of you have ever felt stuck before? You ever felt stuck? Raise your hand. Maybe you felt stuck like this. Let me get that first picture. And there it is. And there it is. And it's, there it is. And there it is. Maybe you f- have, how many love the 405? Go to the next one. Maybe you felt stuck just like her before. Or the next one. Any dads? Or the next one. You'll probably be able to relate to this next one. Maybe it's happened to many of many of us. Right? This story we're going to talk about today has a lot to do with being stuck. And some of us feel stuck sometimes just in life. Maybe you feel stuck at work, what you, what you used to do before doesn't work anymore. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe, maybe your relationship is going through a difficult season. Or maybe it's in parenting. My wife and I are going through that right now. Our daughter is 10 years old now. It's, it's not the same how, how when she used to be 5. Now she has opinions. <laughs> She's got things to say. You know, anybody out there understand what I'm saying? Maybe it's in your personal life. Maybe, you know, everything is kind of okay, but you feel your life is kind of stuck or it just feels, you know, mediocre. Maybe you thought that new car was going to help or maybe you thought that vacation was going to make you feel better, but you just feel stuck. Or how about spiritually? Maybe some of us here grew up in the church and you know, you, 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 you know the routine. You go to church, you sit, you stand, you lift your hands, you pray, you sing. But then you still feel stuck. Or maybe you didn't grow up going to church. And the moment you got into trouble or things got real difficult, you went and found a church and you, you stopped drinking. You drink a little less or, or you pray a little more or you, you listen to a song here and there that talks about God and but you still feel 
stuck. God wants to get us unstuck. If you've ever felt stuck, God wants to get us unstuck. And so I want to read a scripture out of Matthew 21, 15, before we get into the story. It says this, The leading priests and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. But the leaders were indignant. Now I wonder... When did these leaders of the temple become indignant? Were they indignant because Jesus was doing miracles? Were they indignant because young people were shouting Hosanna to the son of David? Or, you know, when did they begin to feel that way? When did they begin to act that way? Was it that morning as they were brushing their teeth, they said, you know, today I'm going to be indignant. Was it a decision they made or, or did it happen little by little? See, Jesus was doing something new. He was doing something they had never seen and they couldn't handle it. They just couldn't handle it. They were stuck. So I've got a word for you today. Jesus wants to do something new in you. He wants to get you unstuck. Can you handle it? Can you handle the Lord doing something new in you? See, when God is going to do something new in our lives, He usually comes and disrupts whatever's going on. Because He wants to reset something. See, when God disrupts your life, let me say it this way. He loves you so much, he's willing to come and disrupt your life. He isn't willing to live, leave you how you are. He wants to make new and he wants to do something new in you. So Jesus tells a story that gets at the heart of this. And in Luke chapter 5, this guy named Levi encounters Jesus. Jesus says, come and follow me. So he starts following Jesus. And he throws a party for him. And he throws this big party. And scripture tells us that tax collectors and sinners of the day were showing up to the party. Now, I, I want you to think about this. Is that every time Jesus spoke... He was speaking to two types of people. It was the kind of people that felt they were so sinful they were far from God. They were too far. And it was the kind of people that were hearing him out that felt they were so good. And that they fulfilled all the rules that they were so close to God. And those people show up to the party as well. So not just the tax collectors and the sinners, the people, the people that everybody despised. They didn't like them. But it was also the religious people that showed up. They heard about this party. A crowd shows up. They show up to the party too. Maybe they, were, they weren't invited. Uninvited to the party. And they show up. And they start complaining. And they're angry. And they're talking to the disciples. And they say, why are you guys doing this? In fact, the NLT version says, why are you eating and drinking with the scum of the earth? So they felt they were better than everybody. And I love that when you read scripture, in verse 31, Jesus overhears them talking and he says, hey, the healthy people, healthy people don't need a doctor. The sick people do. And I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, in other words, you guys, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. So Jesus is saying, I'm having this party. It's not just a party. It's a meaningful party because it has spiritual impact. It can change people's lives. So here's the situation. This group shows up. These religious people are stuck in their ways. They're stuck in their religion. They have no relationship with God. They were extreme with the commandments. You know, they said things like, keep, when God says, keep my words on your mind, they, they did things like this. If maybe you've, you've seen it. I, have, I brought a picture. 
They put the Torah on their forehead. They, 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 they took it to an extreme. You know, they kept the Sabbath holy. They, they took a day to rest. They had rules even about how far you could walk. And Jesus begins to address this. In Luke 5.33, this will be on your screen, it says this. One day, some people said to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? So the Pharisees were offended. We read earlier today in Matthew, they were indignant. They were angry. They were bitter. Because they observed an ancient practice of fasting, to de of depriving yourself to be close to God or to get near to God. They, they would not eat any food or have any, anything to drink. And they would, be, they would take it to an extreme. They'd look somber all the time. So they're mad that the friends of Jesus are having a party. They're dancing. They're eating. And they're drinking. Now, I don't know what they were eating, but I like to think they were eating birria. <laughs> If you've ever had birria, you know what I'm talking about. And maybe the juices are all in their fingers. And they're mad because they're fasting. Right? And they look somber. And Jesus is saying, hey, listen, we're having a party. You're invited to the party. They took fasting to an extreme. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something about fasting quickly. It's, in Scripture, there's only one place in the Bible where fasting is commanded or required. That's in the book of Leviticus 16. And that's when they were trying, when, when it was the day of atonement. What we know now as Yom Kippur. It, it was so people could get right with God. That was commanded. All other fasting was permissible, but you did it to invite God to a situation. But these religious people took it to an extreme because they'd fast twice a week. And so God is... Is, is talking to these Pharisees, these religious people. And he's saying, your religion is false. That's what he's saying. Your religion is false. You've, you've added all these things to the, old, to the thing I've asked you to do. And that's what religion is. It's when you add all these other rules to what God has asked you to do. Now, I grew up in a church, a little church, south of downtown L.A., where everything was bad. Everything. Going to the movies was bad. Talking to girls was bad. If I believed that lie, I would never have gotten married. Thank God I broke free. Every time we add rules to what God has asked us to do, that is religion. And so they're mad. They're mad that Jesus isn't adding what they had added. Or, in other words, he, he's not rolling with the program. And many Christians today are being duped by religion in the name of God. And God wants to do something new in your life. God wants to do something in my life. But we've got to get rid of our religion. And that was their complaint. Their concern was they weren't into their rituals. We fast, we pray, and you guys are eating and drinking. If you've ever seen Jewish people party, man, they party. And so he goes deeper and he, he responds, verse 34. Do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Jesus says, think about a wedding. Now I've done many weddings. I did one last week. It was beautiful. 
I've never been to a wedding where there was no food and no drink. That would be a really sad wedding. I've been to weddings where everyone's celebrating. Everybody's happy. Everyone's joyful. They're celebrating the groom because he's marrying his bride. They're celebrating the bride. Now, the groom doesn't care about the party. He doesn't care about the reception, if you catch my drift. (laughs) He's happy for other reasons. But they're joyful. There's food. There's drink. And Jesus is saying, hey, when the groom is around, you party. When the groom is around, you party. And what he's really getting at is he's saying this. Hey, you guys keep rules to honor God, but I'm here. He said, you you fast and you look somber to to give the appearance that you're close to God, or or you, you fast so you can think about God, but God is here. He's saying you, your rules were meant to prepare you for me. And now I'm here. I'm here. And he continues. But someday the groom will be taken away from them. And then they will fast. So while I'm here, party. Party. There'll be a time for fasting, and it's when I'm gone. And that's when Jesus went to the cross. He was crucified. The bridegroom was taken away. And he was crucified. The party stopped. His disciples fled. They were hiding because they were afraid they'd be next to be executed. It was not a time to party anymore. So here's what we can get from that. Is that... It is the presence or the absence of Jesus that determines whether you have a party or you have sadness. Whether you have a feast or you have famine. It is the presence of Jesus that determines that. Because when he shows up, he can pull you out of depression. When he shows up, He can bring joy when you're sad. When he shows up, he'll give you beauty for your ashes. When he shows up, his joy will be your strength. But it is the presence of Jesus that determines all of that. So, verse 36. Then Jesus gave them this illustration. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch an old garment. For then the new garment would be ruined and the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. He said, you'd ruin it. You'd make a bigger hole. Verse 37. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins for the new wine would burst the wineskins Spilling the wine and ruining the skins. Now why is Jesus talking about old and new stuff here? He's talking about the old covenant and the new covenant. He's talking about pre-Christ and he's talking about post-Christ. Now that he's here. See, now that he's here, Jesus brings salvation, new life, hope. Love, joy, purpose. He introduces a new way of living. See, before the law brought us to, to, to have awareness and brings us to repentance. But now that Jesus was here, he brings us into his kingdom. Jesus brings you into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. So this new covenant cannot, it cannot be attached to the old one. So you can't take Jesus and fit him in the old model. 
You can't take Jesus and fit him in the old covenant. It's a new covenant. It fulfills the old, but you don't return. You move forward. Let me read verse 37 again. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. So the first illustration Jesus uses is the garment. You can't put new garment on an old garment. It'll tear. His second illustration is wine. You can't put new wine in old wineskins. Now back in that time, those days, they press the wine and put it in some containers and the fermentation process would start and fermentation creates gases. And then they take it, after a couple days, a few days, they take that wine and pour it into goat skins that they had sewn together. But the goat skins had to be new because then more fermentation would happen and more gases would happen and then the new skin would be able to have some elasticity. It would stretch. Now if you poured that new wine in an old wineskin that had been recycled, it had already stretched what it could have stretched. So then when more gases would happen, it would tear, burst, and you'd lose the wineskin and the new wine. So Jesus is saying, I came here to do something new. I am the new wine, and it can't fit in your old model. So when God wants to do something in your life, it can't fit in your old self. That's why you and I are made new creations in Christ. You need to be a new wineskin. Say amen. Amen. So if you, put, if you try to put an old piece of cloth and new, new clothing, you're gonna, it's going to get worse. You put old, new wine in old wineskin, it's going to tear. It's going to get ruined. Verse 38. New wine must be stored in new wineskins. Everybody say new wine. What Jesus is saying is, I didn't come here to patch up your religion. I didn't come here to, 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 with a new message so you can put it in the old model. Or what he's saying is, I can't just be an add-on. Or what he's saying is, I'm not just an item on a buffet. See, because some of us do that. We want Jesus to be part of certain areas of our lives only when we, when we see it fit. So we say, Lord, I know you're the provider. Provide for me. But don't mess with my wallet, Jesus. This is my wallet. This is mine. Lord, I want you to to heal my marriage, but you're still a jerk to your wife. (laughs) One one woman said, preach, Pastor Mario. Maybe every, every other woman has her husband next to him. Don't worry, he's doing a new thing. So we want Jesus to be part of our lives only when we feel like it. Only when it suits us. Maybe you're a business owner. How are your ethics? Is Jesus part of your business? See, Jesus is saying, I want to do something new. But what I, the new thing I want to do in you won't fit in your old you. You've got to be renewed. New wine must be stored in new wineskins. Jesus was bringing a new message that could not be contained in the old laws. See, before 
they sacrificed animals until the ultimate sacrifice arrived, Jesus. Before they observed religious holidays and feasts to remember how God delivered them from, the, from, from slavery, delivered them in the past, now they've got the deliverer standing right in front of them. Before they fasted and they prayed and they, they looked somber all the time and they, they, they prayed for the arrival of the Messiah and now the Messiah was here. And the old methods need to be updated. So here's the bottom line. New results or the new thing that God wants to do requires new behaviors. Here's what this meant for the Pharisees. He's saying, hey, you guys are comfortable with all your rules and your laws, but you have no grace. Uh, you love your rules, but, but you have no relationships. You, you want the new thing that I bring, but you want it to fit in your old ways. And new results require new methods or new behavior. Here's the problem for us is that we do the same thing as the Pharisees. We do. If you grew up in the church, I hear this often. I hear, oh, how I, I miss the old songs. I miss them. You know, and some of us, when we, if you grew up in the church, you, you, You'll remember some of those old songs and, 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 and it's not that you love the song so much. It's what it makes you feel. Right? And so maybe you're singing this old hymn and, and that's how you met the Lord. And, and it takes you back to how you met the Lord and you're feeling amazing. And then you open your eyes and you look to your left and the person next to you is like this. And you're like, what's wrong with you? This song is amazing. The hymns are the best. And although, yes, hymns are beautiful. And we do them in this church. Because we, we love the hymns. But you can't deify the old. And, and, and ignore or... Give less value to the new thing God is doing. Amen? Because he's doing new things. He's giving the church new songs. So when you hear a new song, even if you'd rather hear a hymn, sing the new song. Because you know what? In a hundred years, that's going to be a hymn. But guess what? You won't be around. So it's a good thing that the Lord gives the church new songs. That's just an example on hymns. But are you in love so much with what God did in the past that you miss out on what he's doing right now? So we have a decision to make. We have to avoid becoming old wineskins. Turn to the person next to you. And I just look them up and down and don't say anything. Now, what are some of the things that turn you into an old wineskin? For some, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Can we be honest? For some, it's age. It's age. You know, I, I, sometimes I, ca I have to catch myself. And I'm like, Mario, you're getting old. I know I still look 30. But I'm not 30 anymore. You know, I'm 43 now, and 
And sometimes I encounter some younger people that are, you know, 18 or 15 or 23. And I'm like, I wasn't like that when I was 23. <laughs> no, because you're old. <laughs> Anybody ever act like that? Those of us that are a little older. And you say things like, when I was their age, I was doing this and I was doing that. And, and, and you start, right, right? Everybody's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But reality is age can cause us to become old wineskins. But becoming an old wineskin actually has nothing to do with age. It has everything to do with how you allow God to work in your life. So I try to hang out with young people. I do. I like to hang out with older folks too. There's a lot of wisdom there. But I like to hang with young people. Because they challenge me. They challenge the way I think. I don't show it to them. I will go home and I'm like, what is going on? What's wrong with me? Becoming an old wineskin can cause us to miss out on the new that God is doing. Why? You know, the, these, the first scripture we read, the, the, the religious people are angry because young people are shouting and yelling. Because they need to be reverent. In the church. There needs to be reverence. They missed out on the new that God was doing. So let's dig a little deeper. Some of you are new in Christ. For years, the church has just been an afterthought. Or God's been Sort of like this fire extinguisher. You break the glass if needed. You call on God when you're in trouble. But God is telling you today, hey, you want, you want me to do something new for real in your life? You need a new behavior. It's time to read your Bible. It's time to pray. It's time to make going to church a priority. It's time to get it around other people that follow Christ. Join the team. Serve on a team. Some people here are struggling with a habit, an addiction, a hang-up. And God keeps trying to pull you out, but you keep sabotaging yourself. God is saying new results require new behaviors. Maybe you've been in the church a really long time. God requires new behaviors. You can't fit God in your old model. He wants to do something new. Amen. So I've got four things quickly. How do we avoid becoming an old wineskin? Number one, don't trust your experience. That's me saying, when I was 23, I wasn't doing that. This is what you should do. Hey, don't trust your experience. Although there's a lot of wisdom, listen to the Lord. Don't trust what you know. There's wisdom in what you know. There's value in what you know. But don't trust in your own understanding. Seek God's counsel. Can you say amen? amen. So Jesus is pouring out this new wine. He wants to pour it over you, but you've got to be new. Don't trust what you know. Isaiah 43, 19 says, for I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Don't you see it? They couldn't see Jesus. Religion keeps you blind. 
They could not see Jesus. They were trusting in their own experience, in the laws, in the rules. And Jesus says, now I'm here. Let's party. Let's drink. Let's eat. Number two, be grateful. Be grateful. Thank God at all times. In every season, in every situation. It doesn't say thank God for every situation. It says thank God in every situation. Because some of those seasons we don't feel like thanking God because they're tough. But he still says thank me. You know why? Because being grateful would change your perspective. It will. I don't know how many of you remember the movie Nacho Libre. One of my favorite movies ever. Because that was me growing up. And I remember a, 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 a part in, you know, Nacho is at the orphanage and, and Nacho's serving lunch and it's a really ugly looking meal. It looks awful. And this little boy that's staring at the plate and you could tell he's disappointed. And Nacho goes down to his level and he says, level and he says, be grateful, Juan Pablo. <laughs> be grateful in every season. That's how you avoid becoming an old wineskin. Hey, listen, some of you this morning got up and you opened your closet doors and you said, I have nothing to wear. Nobody said preach there. No, no women said preach. <laughs> A man should have said preach. <laughs> hey, so, some of you woke up this morning and the first thing you said was, oh, tomorrow's Monday. <laughs> and guess what? You don't know if you're going to make it to Monday. So be grateful for today. Be grateful. Be grateful for what you have now and stop complaining for what you don't have. Hey, we're real good at complaining, right? Be grateful for the apartment you have right now. Stop complaining that you don't have the house you wished. You ha what you have now is what God has given you. So be grateful right now. That's how you avoid becoming an old wineskin. Number three, be like a child. Now listen, it says, it doesn't say be a child. It says be like a child. With the innocence, with the faith, with the hope. I love seeing that in my daughter, Sarah. She's always hopeful. Always hopeful. Always. Jesus is saying, hey, be like a child. Matthew 18, 3 says, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. The version of the voice says, unless you change. I love that we have the capacity to change. I love that. We can change. You can change. God does want to do something new in you. But you need to change. Listen, sometimes we, we say things or we have these sort of romantic ideas that, that, that God is going to you know, it, it, he's just going to leave you the way you are. That it's okay. It's fine that you keep sinning. It's fine that you keep doing the things you shouldn't do. And, and, and there are no consequences as long as you go to church once in a while and you pray. And that's trying to fit the new thing that God wants to do in your life in your old ways. God can't fit into your old lies. He can't do that. He wants to do a new thing. 
Be like a child, trust in God, have faith, be hopeful, be joyful, run and say Hosanna to the son of David. And number four, don't lose your ability or your capacity to be amazed. Remember I said, be like a child? Do you remember when everything used to amaze you? Before you were hit by the trials of life and the difficulty of life, everything amazed you. I remember being a little kid and going to my grandma's house. And I was, I was amazed at being at her house. It was, ama- it was huge. She had a huge house. Running up and down the stairs. It was, a, it was a huge house. And then I went back many, many decades later to visit her house in Mexico. And I was like, that's it? Yeah. <laughs> it was a little house. But when I was a kid, I was amazed. I was amazed. When did you lose your sense to be amazed? Remember when simple things used to cause you to be amazed? When was the last time you saw a sunset and you were amazed? When was the last time you thanked God for your children, even if they drive you nuts? When was the last time you thank God for your job, your employment? You thank God for your car. And if you don't have a car, you thank God for the bus. When was the last time you were amazed when someone raised their hand and gave their life to, their life to Christ? So we don't get amazed anymore. Because we've lost our capacity to be amazed because we've become old wineskins. And for the new wine that Jesus wants to pour over us, in us, we've got to be new wineskins. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for every person here, every person watching online. Lord, I pray that you would help us become new wineskins. Some of us are stuck in our religion, are stuck in our ways, and are stuck in our lies. And, and the, the new thing you want to do, the new thing you are willing to do in our lives, Lord, can only be done when we are made new. So Lord, would you make us new? Would you do me a favor, just open up your arms right there where you're sitting. And, and just in your own words, would you just ask the Lord to make you new? Just tell them in your own words, Lord, make me new. Make me new, Jesus. Make me new, Father. Make me new, O oh Lord. Make us new. Maybe you've been in the church a long, long time and you need to be made new. Maybe you've fallen, in, fallen into a routine, to a religion. You need to be made new. Lord, I pray that you would touch those people today that need to be made new. Maybe you've not been in the church long. Maybe this is the first time you're here. Or maybe you're still trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. You're still trying to figure out this, this Jesus and how he can impact your life and transform your life. Maybe you've never given your life to, to Christ, Jesus Christ. You've never made a decision to follow. Well, today's the day you can make that decision. Hey, it, it, with all our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to ask a question. If there's anyone in the room or maybe you're watching online and you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to give your life to Christ today. And you want to say, Lord... I want you to do something new in me. 
Would you just raise your hand? I want to agree with you and I want to pray with you. Raise your hand real high. There's a hand right here. Hallelujah. I agree with you. I agree with you. There's no one over there. I agree with you. Here too. Back there. I agree with you. Hey church, would you, let's help our brothers and sisters that raise their hand. Let's help them pray. Would you repeat this prayer with me, everybody? Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Come into my heart. Take control of my life. Help me, help me follow you wholeheartedly. In your name, Jesus. Amen.